segment four for chapter 10 properties of gases uh, we had just finished up with stoichiometry using the ideal gas law and next we're going to turn our focus over to Dalton's law of partial pressures so for a mixture of non-reacting gases in a container the total pressure exerted is the sum of all the individual partial pressures that each gas would exert alone so in other words P total is simply equal to the pressure of gas A plus the pressure of gas B plus the pressure of gas C plus and then dot dot dot. However many gases you have, each one has its own individual pressure. The total pressure in the container then would be the sum of all the different gases. So A, B, and C would be the partial pressure for each gas. All right? So this is the pressure that particular gas would exert if it were alone in the container. So we're going to assume that each gas is going to be behaving ideally. And so the partial pressure of each gas then can be calculated from the ideal gas law. So PA would be equal to the moles of A. PB would be equivalent to the ratio of the moles of B, so forth and so on. So the total pressure then would be P total would be equal to N A. So N sub A RT over V, N sub B RT over V, so forth and so on. So we can rearrange all of that and get P total is equal to the moles of A plus the moles of B plus the moles of C times RT over V. Or if you prefer, you just write it as P total would equal N total times RT over V. And again, N total would be equal to all the different moles we'd be adding up for each gas. Okay. Now, means for mixture of ideal gases then, total number of moles of particles is going to be important. It's not the composition or the identity of the involved particles, just how many are there. Pressure exerted by ideal gases, not affected by the identity of the gas particle. So we're making some assumptions there, that there's no sort of, you know, other interaction between the different particle types, so that we're only concerned with what, how, I shouldn't say not what, but how many particles are there. Now, it reveals two important facts about ideal gases. Number one, the volume of indi individual gas particles must be important. And the forces among the particles must not be important. Okay, so we're going to say that the volume of the individual gas particles must be important. And the forces among the particles must not be important. If they were important, the pressure would be dependent on the identity of the gas. So for example, mixtures of helium and oxygen are used in scuba diving tanks to help prevent the bends. For a particular dive, 46 liters of helium at 25 degrees C in one atmosphere and 12 liters of oxygen at 25 degrees C in one atmosphere were pumped into a tank with a volume of 5 liters. Calculate the partial pressure of each gas and the total pressure in the tank at 25 degrees C. So we're going to have two sets of conditions, right? We have helium, or P one is going to be equal one atmosphere and P final, which will equal the pressure of the helium. Now we're going to take 46 liters at one atmosphere and put it into a five liter container. We're going to do that same thing with oxygen, but we're going to start with 12 liters of oxygen. We're going to put it into the same five liter tank. So first we're going to calculate the pressure that each gas has in the five liter tank. So the pressure of helium then would be PI over VI, or PI times VI over VF, right? So just PV, P, PV equals PV, right? P1, V1 equals P2, V2. That com comes out to 9.2 atmospheres. Then we'll do the same thing for the oxygen, and that comes out to 2.4 atmospheres. Then we'll use these partial pressures to calculate the total pressure by simply summing them up. And so we get 11.6 atmospheres for the tank. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? All right, a mixture of 250 milliliters of methane at 35 degrees C and 0.55 atmospheres and 750 milliliters of propane at 35 degrees C and 1.5 atmospheres were introduced into a 10 liter container. What is the final pressure in tour of the mixture? There are your options, and again, I'll give you a few moments. Maybe you pause it, take as long as you need, jot down some notes, and see if you can come up with the right answer. Hopefully, the answer you come up with is on the list.
and hopefully it's A. All right, so how did we get there? Well, first, we'll take the pressure of methane. So the pressure of the methane, remember, was 0.55 atmospheres, 250 milliliters. We're going to put it in a 10 liter tank. That gives us 0 0.0138 atmospheres. For the propane, it was 1.5 atmospheres, but it was 750 milliliters. But we're also going to put that into the same 10 liter tank. That gave us 0 0.112 atmospheres. The total pressure then would be the summation of the two partials, but that's in atmospheres, and we'll need to convert that. And there are 760 torr per atmosphere, so a total of 95.6 torr. All right. Mole fractions and mole percents. Now we've worked fractions in a couple of different topics here. This is going to be the same thing. The mole fraction, um, I think that's chi, I don't remember. Um, ratio of number of moles of given component in the mixture to the total number of moles in the mixture. So in other words, we're going to take Na and put that over the entire total. So the Na over N total would be the mole fraction. The mole percent would be that fraction times 100%. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? So take the number of moles of A, divide by the total moles there, that is your mole fraction. If you multiply that by 100%, that's your mole percentage. A mixture consists of 122 blue, 137 red, and 212 yellow M&Ms. What is the fraction of each? So again, first we'll calculate total. I feel like doing this problem live instead of just giving you the answers like that. So let's see, we have 122 blue, 137 red, 212 yellow, for a total of 471. So we'll take 122 divided by 471, and that's 0.259 blue. Well, look no further, I'm going to say A, and there it is. All right. So for the blue, you get 0.259. You know it can be D or E, right? You can't go over one. Same with B. And then C didn't add up to one. Oh, could have made that a lot easier without even doing the work. All right. A mixture consists of 122 moles of nitrogen, 137 moles of propane, and 212 moles of CO2. What is the mole fraction of each? You see what they did there, right? They just changed the M&Ms into atoms. So hopefully you got A again, same values. All right, mole fractions of gases from partial pressures. So now Na is equal to PAV over RT. If V and T are constant, then V over RT becomes a constant. For mixtures of gases in one container, that means the volume and the temperature are pretty much gonna be constant, then we know the mole fraction would just simply be PA over the individual P's totaled up, right? The V over RT cancels, leaving us with just the pressures. Or if you prefer, PA over P total would be equal to NA over N total. And so we can get from partial pressures right to moles if we look at the mole fraction and the, and the fractional pressures. The partial pressure of oxygen was observed to be 156 torr in air with a total atmospheric pressure of 743. Calculate the mole fraction of O2 present. So again, we can simply use the fractions of the pressures to get the mole fraction. So we'll plug in 156 divided by 743 and we get 0.210. All right. Partial pressure of a particular component of a gaseous mixture equals more fraction of that component times the total pressure. So again, we're just rearranging here and playing games with that fraction, right? So we can figure out the pressure of A if we know the mole fraction and we know the total pressure. The mole fraction of nitrogen in air is 0 0.7808. Calculate the partial pressure of nitrogen in air when the atmospheric pressure is 760 torr. So we have the pressure of nitrogen is equal to the mole fraction times the total pressure. So we're simply going to plug and chug here. 0.7808 times 760 
gives us 593. So the pressure of the nitrogen then is 593 torr. All right, a mixture of 250 milliliters of methane and 0.55 atmospheres, 750 milliliters of propane at 35 degrees C and 1.5 atmospheres was introduced into a 10 liter container. We've seen this question before, except now, what is the mole fraction of methane in the mixture? So we can do the pressure of A is equal to the mole fraction times the total pressure, which means the mole fraction would be equal to the pressure of A over the total pressure. So 0.55 So we got B. So we're going to take 0.55 times 0 0.250 liters divided by 10 liters gives us 0 0.0138 atmospheres. Right? Liters cancels out. So that's the pressure of the methane. Then we can take the, the pressure of the propane. And then we can take the pressure of the methane over the pressure of the propane. And that gives us 0 0.110. So answer is ultimately limited to two significant figures by the numerator, which rigorously is only allowed two significant figures. <clears throat> All right. A mixture consists of 122 moles of nitrogen. Oh, we've seen this before, right? Um, 137 moles of propane and 212 moles of CO2 at 200K in a 75 liter container. What is the total pressure of the gas and the partial pressure of CO2. So again, this one might take a little bit of time. Hopefully you paused it, did some work, and you came out with C. And of course, this is how we did it. So we took the 471 moles, right? That's our total M and M's, multiplied by R times T in Kelvin divided by V, and that gave us our total P. So we know the total pressure then is 103 atmospheres. Then we know the total pressure, excuse me, the total moles, and we know the moles of CO2. That's our mole fraction. So that's gonna be 0 0.450. Multiplying the two together gives us the pressure of just the CO2 at 46.4 atmospheres. All right, moving right along. Next thing we want to look at is collecting gases over water. So this is how we actually do things in the lab. Application of Dalton's law of partial pressures. So gases that don't react with water can be trapped over water. Now, obviously, if it reacts with water, that would be no bueno. Whenever gas is collected by displacement of water, mixture of gases results, right? So you can see what's going on here. We're going to take um, a pit, I don't know what you call that, like a glass, it's not really a bowl because it's a flat bottom. I don't, I'm sure it has a, a name in the lab. I don't know what that name is. But anyway, we're going to take this container and we're going to put water in it. Then we're usually going to take, um, we'll actually use Erlenmeyer flasks when we do this experiment, um, which is not what this is. This is a, some sort of small neck bottle. Um, but what we'll do is, is we'll put water and your Erlenmeyer flask, then turn it upside down and put the head of the Erlenmeyer flask under the water, right? So now all that water stays in here. And then you take a tube, run that into that flask, and then you do your reaction or do whatever it is you're doing. And the gas, of course, when it comes off, will bubble up in. And then, of course, this pushes all of that water out, and you'll just capture that water down here. The water is worthless, really. We don't care about the water. All we care about is catching that gas inside. Right now we call that the wet gas because it's obviously just blown through water and we collected it. So gas in the bottle is a mixture of water vapor, which is going to come off as we bubble, and the gas that you're actually trying to collect. All right, so water vapor is present because the molecules of water escape from the surface of the liquid and collect in space above the liquid, right? So there's always going to be some water in there. There's no way to get, to get rid of that while you're doing the reaction. Um, so molecules of water return to liquid when the rate of escape is equal to the rate of return. So the number of water molecules and the vapor state remains a constant. 
Now, the gas is saturated with water vapor. We call that a wet gas. Now, vapor pressure. The pressure exerted by a vapor present in space above any liquid. So, it's a constant at constant temperature. When a wet gas is collected over water, we usually want to know how much dry gas that's going to correspond to. So, how do we get that? Well, we know that P total is equal to the P of the gas plus the water vapor itself, so P of water. If we rearrange that, then of course we know the pressure of the gas then would be equal to the total minus the water. So how are you going to get the water? Well, we'll usually tell you that in a question, right? A sample of oxygen is collected over water at 20 degrees C and a pressure of 738 torr. Its volume is 310 milliliters. The vapor pressure of the water at 20 degrees C is 17.54 torr. And there it is. You now have the vapor pressure. What is the partial pressure of O2? And what would the volume be when dry at STP? So A, the pressure of the oxygen would equal the total pressure minus the pressure of the water. So 738 torr minus that 17.5 for the water vapor gives us 720 torr. Now, for B, we're going to use the combined gas law to calculate the pressure of the oxygen at STP. So we know at STP, pressure 1 would be 720, pressure 2 is going to be 760, the volume of 1 is going to be 310. We're looking for the second volume, right? So this is your STP pressure, 760. This is the pressure we're actually at. Temperature 1 is going to be 293, and of course temperature 2 we're going to set to be 273. At this point, we'll use the combined gas law, plug and chug, solving for V2. Tor will cancel out, Kelvin will cancel out, and we're left with 274 milliliters. So that would be the amount of dry gas that we were able to collect. All right, an unknown gas was collected by water displacement. The following data was recorded. So we have a temperature, we have a volume, we have a pressure, we know the mass of the gas, and we know the water vapor. Determine the molecular weight of the gas. Right, so determine the molecular weight. Remember, molecular weight is grams per mole. Hint, hint, solve for moles. And hopefully you've paused, you've done some work, and you've come up with C. All right, how did we get to C? Well, you know the molar mass will be the mass times R times T divided by P over V. So we know the mass is 0 0.0873. We're going to use 0 0.0821 as our R. Converting our temperature to, to Kelvin, we get 300. We know that the pressure would be the 750, but minus the water vapor of 26.98. And of course, that was going to give a volume of 0 0.0375. We'll multiply all that by 760 torr per atmosphere. So that we're in atmospheric pressure. Able to cancel that out with our R. Liters will cancel out. Atmospheres cancels out. Kelvin cancels out. Torr will all cancel out. And we're left with 60.3 grams per mole. Moving right on to diffusion. All right. So for diffusion, it's just the spreading out and intermingling of molecules of one gas into and among those of another. So in other words, I have a container full of air. I'm going to take the perfume and the bulb. And of course, if you squeeze the bulb, it shoots perfume out. And so diffusion is looking at how these molecules all spread out. So here we're told the path of the perfume is erratic because of the random collisions with air molecules. Okay, so it's just going to spread out everywhere. So complete spreading out. Now that's diffusion. Effusion is a little different. Movement of gas molecules through extremely small opening into a vacuum. So now what we have is a vacuum over here. We have a gas over here. And effusion is these gas molecules moving into the vacuum space. So there are no other gases there. In other words, there's no collisions that can take place. The effusion is just sort of happening. It's going over and just spreading out, but there's nothing to run into. Diffusion is it's coming over, but then it's hitting other gas molecules and spreading around in that erratic pattern. 
Now, Thomas Graham studied the relationship between effusion and molecular masses for a series of gases. So he wanted to minimize the collisions. In other words, slow the molecules down and make the molecules bump aside or move to the rear, not into each other, like not into another gas that's there. In doing that, he came up with the Graham's Law of Effusion. Rates of effusion of gases are inversely proportional to the square roots of their densities when compared at identical pressures and temperatures. So his effusion rate then is a ratio of one over the square root of the density. Now again, that means you have a constant pressure and temperature. As pressure and temperature changes, you'll get a new rate constant. The effusion rate then is times the square root of the, of the density. It's equal to some constant K. K is virtually identical for all gases. And that's the crazy part, right? So the effusion rate of A times the density of A is equal to the effusion rate of B times the square root of the effusion rate, excuse me, the, the density of B. Rearranging these, we can say that the density of A is proportional to its molar mass. Okay, so the effusion rate of A divided by the effusion rate of B would be equal to the square root of the density of B over the density of A, which that part doesn't matter, but what does matter is the molar mass of B divided by the molar mass of A. So in other words, we now have another way to figure out the molar mass of a gas by looking at effusion rates. Okay, so the infusion rate then times the square root of the molar mass would be equal to that constant. So, in essence, what he's saying is heavier gases effuse more slowly. Lighter gases should effuse more rapidly. Straightforward there. Hopefully you understand that. All right, here's an example problem. Calculate the ratio of the effusion rates of hydrogen gas and uranium hexafluoride a gas used in the enrichment process to produce fuel for nuclear reactors. So remember your effusion rate times the square root of the molar mass is equal to the K. So first we must compute the molar masses. We know hydrogen is going to be 2.016. UF6 will be 352.02. So now we'll take the effusion rate divided by the effusion rate. So we get the molar mass of UF6 divided by the molar mass of the hydrogen, taking the square root of that, gives us 13.21. Okay. Thus, the very light hydrogen molecules effuse approximately 13 times faster than the UF6 molecules. All right, if it takes methane three minutes to diffuse 10 meters, how long will it take sulfur dioxide to travel the same distance? Or the rates are related to the square root of their molar masses. Hopefully you came up with six minutes. So remember velocity and time are inversely related. So we have the molar weight of one over the molar weight of two, taking that square root would be equal to T1 over T2. So three minutes then over T2 would be equal to the square root of 16.04 divided by 64.06. Your grams per mole, of course, would cancel out for each one. And T2 would then equal six minutes. We might have to go back and try that one a couple times. All right, for the series of gases, helium, neon, argon, hydrogen, and O2, what is the order of increasing rate of effusion? So what is the order of increasing rate of effusion? So first thing we can do is calculate their molar masses. So for each substance then, we'll calculate the molar, ma molar mass. And what's the expectation here? The lightest will be the fastest. So that means hydrogen should be faster than helium, should be faster than neon, should be faster than oxygen, should be faster than argon. All right. All right. How many times faster does UF6 effuse compared to UF6 with the isotope of 238? Okay. So we have two different molar masses. What's that rate going to work out to be? How many times faster 
as the 235 if used compared to the 238. Hopefully you came out with B. So here we're going to take 352, divide by the 349, take the square root of that, and that gives us 1.004. All right. That's going to wrap it up here. A um, little bit longer of a session, but I think we'll be able to get the second session done as we move on to the kinetic theory of gases, and then we'll talk about real gases, and that'll pretty much finish out the chapter. All right. Talk to you soon.